about the most topical business issues of our age and rise above the noise. I'm your host and fellow student, Conrad Chua. Reminder, if you have any questions, please pop them in the comments field, whether you're watching us today on YouTube or LinkedIn. We're at Cambridge Judge Business School today and tremendously honored to have Andre Lacroix, CEO of Intertech. Andre has had a tremendously successful career managing and leading at the very highest levels across the world. Thank you so much, Andre, for speaking with us today. Well, great to be here. Um, I'll just uh, try to structure my opening remarks and then we'll get into Q&A, uh, which is always the most interesting part of things because then you can ask anything you want. Um, just a bit about myself. Um, many, many years ago, I, I was uh, a student like you. Um, I, I graduated from a business school in France uh, called ESCP that you might have heard of. And um, I've been very fortunate uh, to work for some of the most exciting companies in the world, um, working with tremendous, tremendous people. I'll come back to learning uh, later on, but I've never stopped learning since then. Um, and, and what I'm going to try to talk to you about today is, is the way I think about leadership. But before I, I do that, um, the companies I worked for are well known. I worked for Eston Young in, in West Africa. I had the time of my life uh, on the West Coast in Africa. Then I joined Colgate uh, in France and in Germany. Um, I was then in marketing. And then um, circumstances and luck, I guess, and also convincing uh, the company uh, brought me to New York uh, where I joined PepsiCo. I was very young. Uh, I was in charge of the 7-Up brand globally. I was the marketing manager of that brand. Uh, you might have uh, seen the Fido Lido advertising many years ago. If you've seen it, um, that's my creation. I'm the father of Fido Lido uh, ba back then. And then I always wanted to go into leadership and, and Pepsi gave me the opportunity to, to become a general manager. And, and one of the fantastic experiences I had was to um, lead you know, the startup of East Germany for Pepsi when the Berlin Wall came down. It was a fascinating time of global history in, in, in Germany. And then I always wanted to go into, into retail and, and I got the opportunity to lead Burger King, one of my favorite uh, brand. The Whopper is always the best uh, <laughs> when it comes to uh, having a burger. And I had the time of my life. I was uh, based in Munich and I run Burger King Germany and things went extremely well. And then uh, I ended up running the entire you know, uh, Burger King International uh, company, which was incredible. I was, I was very, very young. And then we sold Burger King to private equity, um, to a private equity consortium. And um, magic happens. I got the opportunity to uh, be the CEO of Euro Disney. So I went back to Paris for the first time in a long time to basically run a theme park uh, and to basically offer family entertainment to kids and grandkids and, and, and families. Uh, I mean, I talk quite a bit about it in the book. Uh, it was an intense a few years because we had to do a, a big financial restructuring. It's all public. And then I came back here uh, you know, to London, uh, and, and I've been here since then uh, running an automotive group, uh, working with some of the best brands like uh, Toyota, BMW, Mercedes. And now, of course, I, I run uh, Intertech, uh, a quality assurance company that helps the world to, to get safer, essentially. So that's my background. Uh, what's different, of course, about my experience is I've been very eclectic. Uh, it's very rare for leaders to change industries like I did. Uh, it was not pre-programmed, but I learned a lot because when you move from one industry to the other, you get tremendous experience, but also you get the patterns with you into a new industry and give you different insights and different way of, of learning. It's a faster learning curve. Of course, it's higher risks than playing safe in an industry that you know very well, but my risk appetite is probably higher than most people and, and, uh, and I wouldn't regret anything I've, uh, I've done. And, um, over the years, I, I was asked to talk about leadership. Uh, when you're successful running companies, people are interested in how you do it. And I had never really thought about the way I was leading companies. And uh, 
this is how the idea of the book uh, was born, uh, Leadership We Saw. Uh, and uh, when I kind of stepped back and, and, and thought about why I was driving the performance I was driving for all uh, stakeholders, and I, I realized that I was taking a very different approach. And let me explain that approach going back to his, into history. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a surgeon because I thought that saving people's life was the greatest thing you could do. But then when I was about to make the decision and say it's going to be a 15-year study, I was not sure I was going to go for 15-year study because I didn't want to wait for so long to have an impact on the world, so I decided to go into, into business. And it's only when I became a leader, i.e. running teams, that I reconciled my dream of a, as a kid to what I do every single day. Because essentially, the concept of leadership with soul is, is, is the following. The only, way, the only way to drive sustainable growth and, and value for all stakeholders is to put people at the heart of your growth strategy and your day-to-day -day action. So my leadership approach called leadership with soul is very humanistic in, 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 in nature. And it is my belief that you, future leaders, and all leaders of this planet have got an incredible opportunity to truly unleash the potential of corporations. And I'm not going to be arrogant because it's not the way I am, but I'm going to be direct. I believe that companies today are run much better than they were 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, but are not run the way they should be run. And my view is that companies are overmanaged and underled. There is too, macro, too much macro management, detail management in companies, and not enough what I call good leadership, which is basically inspiring the organization with a meaningful approach to business to take the business from A you know, to Z. And in the book, which is you know, decomposing my leadership uh, model in 10 principles, I use a lot of examples that are examples that I lived myself, right? So the data is pure, the diagnosis is super, 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 you know, precise. There is only one external data point that I use, and it's uh, the Gallup, you know, engagement survey. And, and Gallup is the global authority in what they call workplace science. They basically study the workplace scientifically to understand how people feel. And they've got, you know, a database that goes across all countries thousands, thousands, thousands of companies. And essentially, the conclusion is that 80% of the global workforce is disengaged, which means the level of engagement in a workforce globally is only 20%, which is shocking. And, and that's why I make the statement that you know, companies are overmanaged and underled. And, 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 and the opportunity that you all have as, as future leaders is to basically you know, show some good leadership, which is, of course, they bring financial performance. And, and I'm not saying it's not important, because I run a, a public company, so I understand it very, very, very well. But when you are a leader, you need to take your company from A to Z, serving the interests of all stakeholders, all stakeholders, your customers, your employees, the regulators, the communities, of course, your suppliers, and, and, and the financial shareholders, right? And, and this is tough, but this is why you know, leadership needs to improve because some of the short-term behaviors that we see in companies create this dysfunctional culture that I'm sure we're going to talk about and, and behaviors that are basically heretic and, and, and not you know, serving the good of all stakeholders, right? So that's what I'm trying to basically say you know, with leadership we saw. It's time for leaders to stop and think on how they want to lead for good and, and by you know, listening to the humanist you know, part of their brain and, and putting people at the heart of what they think and what they do in, in, in the company. And, and the way you know, the leadership model is structured is based on 10 principles um, that are equally important. There is no one principle that, that more important than the other one. I talk quite a lot about two fundamental questions as a leader that you always need to challenge yourself with is the what. Are you doing the right thing strategically? Are you really sharpening the focus of the companies on the right opportunities for the short, medium, and long term? And how do people feel? Is the organization truly, truly energized? And, and for me, you know, the, the, the test as, as a leader is where do you get your energy from? And of course, a lot of leaders will say, I get my energy from 
gaining market share, very important. I get my energy from increasing the share price, very important. I get my energy from, uh, of course, uh, you know, improving profitability, but this is not enough. You need to gain energy from inspiring and, and leading people and seeing the organization grow under your leadership. If you ask me, you know, where do I lose my energy in any business situation is not when a team is not successful. It's when the team members are losing confident, confidence and self-belief because they cannot master the challenge ahead. So that's what I'm trying to, to basically say with, with, with the book. I believe that the opportunities for future leaders are immense. Um, I know that the, the, the media is, is quite challenging on geopolitical issues and, and macro issues, and I'm not discounting any of these because this is the world, right? It's never a straight line to, you know, to paradise. But for future leaders like, like you who are going to play a big role in, in, in medium, small, large corporations, the opportunities you have to make a difference is, is immense because companies, in my view, are not truly unleashing their full potential. Now, one final uh, point I will make, and I will go into, into question. Becoming a good leader is a journey. Uh, it is my conviction that you know, leaders are not born. You know, like champions, uh, you know, they might have a, a physical or intellectual predispositions to win, but they need to work very, very hard at becoming you know, good leaders. And if I look at myself, there is no one day when I don't you know, learn something new from a situation, from a person I meet, from a students that I, I will talk to, and, and provided as a leader you rec recognize that you can get better every single day, but you're never going to get to perfection. You're going to get close to it if you work very, very hard. It's going to make you humble and, and, and honest. And, and you know, in, in the book, I, I talk a lot about Greek philosophers and, and what you know, Platon said is, the only thing I know is that I don't know everything. That makes you a very humble leader because as a leader, you need to go into situations with an open mind and being able you know, to, to lead your, your colleagues in, in, into the future. So there is a, a lot of you know, you know, studies that have been made, books have been published on, 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 on leadership. But if I were to, to sum it up in a very simple sentence, essentially for me, you know, good leadership is about achieving great things through people. That's it. It's about achieving things that are going to be enduring, make a fundamental impact in your, in your workplace and in society through people. That's what it's all about. So I'm going to stop here. I'm delighted to, to be here and, and, and get the opportunity to answer some of your questions. Well, Andre, you've got such a long career behind you as you cast your mind back. Were there any career milestones that shaped your leadership style? Oh. Plenty, plenty. Um, I, I would say that the, the, the moment I, I moved from being a strategy, a marketeer, if you want, to becoming a, a sales operational leader, my view of the world changed immediately because you know, I was focusing on the macro side of things, right? Top-down thinking. And I realized that you know, by getting the simple right distribution in the right channel with the right price point and the right merchandising, you could drive demand much faster than, than you thought. And I know it's a bit of a binary comment, but I realized that, you know, as a leader, you need to look at the top-down macro strategic pictures, but also focus on the execution. And, and that was a light bulb moment. And that's why, you know, I, I keep saying that success in business is 1%, you know, um, strategy and 99, 99% ex execution. Uh, look, they've been very, very, um, I would say, um, provoking moments where, when I saw bad leadership in action, people who were above me. And, and that were obviously defining moments because I said to myself, I'm never going to be like that. Or certainly, I will try to do everything and not be that, like that person, right? Really, really important. The, Potentially, the most you know, defining moment in my, in my life has been uh, the, the, the moment I w started working abroad in, in West Africa. I mean, if you put yourself, and I know the world has changed since, since then, but when I grew up in the, nine, in the 80s, right, I was 
in Paris, and there were a few big cities in the world where the power was, right? There was Paris, London, and New York, broadly speaking, in the 80s, right? And people were very, you know, proud of their own little ecosystem in Paris, London, and New York, and were very centered on, uh, you know, uh, on themselves. And the fact that I got the opportunity to discover West Africa and see there was another world outside of Paris, London, and New York changed my, my, my view of the world. And, and today, I don't look at passports, I don't look at nationalities, I don't look at religions, I don't look at where people have studied. I basically look at you know, individuals, and it doesn't matter where you come from, you can have a huge, huge impact in the world. Uh, we are all equal uh, on, on that planet, right? Uh, and that was, and I know it sounds trivial today, but in the 80s, where I grew up, uh, if you are not from one of the best business schools in France or London or you know, Harvard, uh, you are not someone, right? Mm. So things have changed. Um, so I could go on and on and on, but there were you know, some defining moments for me, yeah. Mm. One final question from me is that you talk a lot about leadership and with soul and tapping into that humanist side. Mm. How do you go about assessing people who work under you, um, whether they have these qualities to be, then be promoted into the C-suite and get a huge amount of responsibilities. How do you go about finding those things? That, that's a, that's a very, um, very profound point. Um, and, and let me tell you what companies don't do today. And that's part of the issue, right? Because when I said companies are not well-led, it's not like that leaders don't work hard. Everybody works hard in this world. But the company will promote person A into a role B without the right coaching, without the right training, without the right you know, uh, you know, support. It's like you, know, you drive a Golf, I'm giving you a BMW, here are the keys, but I'm not helping you to drive a BMW. So, and that's you know, a lot of you know, the problems we have today with leadership. People have been promoted to leadership role and they don't get the support. So the way I do it at Intertech, and, and in all the companies I've worked with, number one, I spend a lot of time on talent planning, trying to understand the talent pool, right? Uh, how people are performing in terms of you know, day-to-day performance, strategic impact, the level of IQ and EQ, the, the, the leadership styles, their cultural fit, uh, so that you know, when you consider someone for a new role, you've done your, your homework. Now, the the important point about talent planning is that you never have someone who is ready for the role. And by the way, if you have someone who is ready for the role, maybe that person is not interested for this role because that person will be ready for a bigger role. So there is always an, a, 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 a bit of risk taking, which is, which is fun. You say, you know, hey, you know, Sylvia, we're going to make you, you know, managing director of Germany. Today you were running the sales department. This is the opportunity for you to learn this and this and this. And what you need to do is, is put a, a learning program for that person to make sure that that person gets successful over time. One of the things I, I do uh, each time I appoint a leader that is in a senior role around me, basically uh, ask this person to prepare a, a, a leadership script. And essentially, I've asked the person to think about the growth opportunity to immerse herself or himself on what she or he wants to do differently to basically take the business forward. Call it strategy. And I've asked this person to think about the next you know, 12 months, the next 